cardiac pathology and sudden death in athletes. Sudden cardiac death is a tragic event that occasionally affects apparently healthy individuals, including young athletes under the age of 35 years. About 25 young patients die each year nationally in sudden, initially unexplained deaths on the field in all sports, usually heart-related. A spectrum of cardiac diseases is implicated in sudden cardiac death, with a variable prevalence depending on the age and other demographics of the individual. Usually, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or congenital abnormalities are the key factor. There is a 10 to 1 rate in males to females in the incidence of sudden cardiac death, meaning males are 10 times more likely to experience sudden cardiac death than are females. The sports of football and basketball see the highest rate of incident. Even with the best pre-participation physical examination, certain conditions may go undetected. As such, there is a chance for severe and even catastrophic injury because of a pre-existing condition. The circulatory system includes the heart and the blood vessels and the lymphatic system. This includes arteries, arterioles, veins, venules, and capillaries. The function of the circulatory system is to transport oxygen, nutrients, and hormones to cells, remove waste products and carbon dioxide from cells, defend the body against infections, and prevent blood loss through clotting. The lymphatic system includes the lymph capillaries, the lacteals, nodes, vessels, and the ducts. The lymphatic system functions to transport fluids, nutrients, including fats and proteins, and wastes excluded from tissues back to the bloodstream through the connections of major veins. The pulmonary and systemic circulation in an adult. The cardiovascular system is composed of two circulatory paths. The pulmonary circulation, the circuit through the lungs where the blood is oxygenated, and the systemic circulation, the circuit through the rest of the body to provide oxygenated blood. Pulmonary circulation only occurs between the heart and the lungs. Systemic circulation refers to the circulation of the blood in which oxygenated blood is pumped from the heart to the body and deoxygenated blood is returned back to the heart. Systemic circulation occurs between the heart and the entire body. The lymphatic system with major lymph nodes is the pale green area denoting the body areas drained by the right lymphatic duct. The rest of the body is drained by the thoracic duct. Anemia is a condition that develops when your blood lacks enough healthy red blood cells or hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a main part of the red blood cell and binds oxygen. If you have too few or abnormal red blood cells, your hemoglobin is abnormal or low. The cells in your body will not get enough oxygen. The body needs red blood cells to survive. They carry hemoglobin, a complex protein that contains iron molecules. These molecules carry oxygen from the lungs to the rest of the body. Some diseases and conditions can result in low levels of red blood cells. There are many types of anemia, and there is no single cause. It can sometimes be difficult to pinpoint the exact cause. There are several predisposing factors that may increase the risk of developing anemia personal or a family history of anemia, bleeding disorders or chronic disease, intermittent jaundice in early life, excessive menstrual flow, increased duration, frequency, or volume of blood loss, chronic blood loss through gastrointestinal bleeding, such as the chronic use of aspirin or NSAIDs, certain drugs or toxins, childbirth, disadvantaged social economic background, poor diet or dietary restrictions, including vegetarian diet, weight loss diets or fad diets, cancer, a volunteer blood donor, or diminished hepatic, renal, or thyroid function. There are three stages of anemia. It is characterized by ferritin, an iron protein complex, less than 12 milligrams per milliliter, which indicates a reduced iron store in the bone marrow. Other components of iron status remain normal. Stage two is iron deficiency, Erythropoiesis follows several months of iron depletion. This is characterized by decreased levels of circulating iron, but hemoglobin and hematocrit remain normal. Stage 3 Iron Deficiency Anemia follows several weeks of iron-deficient erythropoiesis. 
and individuals develop chronic recognized iron deficiency anemia. The signs and symptoms of anemia are recurrent bouts of swollen, painful, and inflamed hands and feet, tachycardia, severe fatigue, headache, pallor or a lightening color of the skin, and muscle weakness. There is no known treatment to reverse this condition. We try to hydrate the individual and maybe the use of iron supplements can help. We want to use caution in conducive environments especially when we're exercising in extreme cold or extreme heat. The effects of anemia on physical activity. Anemia will decrease the maximum aerobic capacity that's available for the individual. This decreases the physical work capability at submaximal levels. It increases the lactic acidosis of the individual, which increases fatigue and decreases exercise time to exhaustion. There are predisposing factors for individuals with anemia, so we need to be aware of those. Iron deficiency anemia develops gradually through several stages, as we've discussed, before anemia is actually evident. Iron deficiency is the most common nutritional deficiency in the United States, affecting 7.8 million adolescent girls and women of childbearing age. Among men, males 18 years or older, and postmenopausal women in the United States, iron deficiency anemia is uncommon. This condition is also seen in endurance athletes and individuals who maintain a low percentage of body fat. Iron deficiency anemia is characterized by deficient hemoglobin synthesis. Early signs and symptoms include fatigue, tachycardia, blood mixed with feces, pallor, and epithelial abnormalities. The later signs and symptoms include cardiac murmurs, congestive heart failure, loss of hair, and a pearly sclera. To treat iron deficiency anemia, we want to include a dietary iron supplement and exorbic acid to enhance the iron absorption. We want to encourage the individual to avoid caffeine because caffeine hampers iron absorption. Exercise-induced hemolytic anemia occurs during exercise when the red blood cells are destroyed and the hemoglobin is liberated into the medium in which the cells are suspended, also called the intravascular hemolysis. This is from high impact activities such as running. The trauma of repetitive hard foot strikes destroys the red blood cells, sometimes referred to as foot strike hemolysis, more commonly observed in marathoners and middle aged distance runners. In a low impact, it has also been reported in competitive swimmers and rowers. The prevention and treatment focuses on encouraging runners to be lean, run on soft surfaces, run light on their feet, and wear well-cushioned shoes and insoles. Exercise-induced hemolytic anemia or runner's anemia is rarely severe enough to cause appreciable iron loss. Sickle cell anemia is most commonly seen in African Americans resulting from abnormalities in hemoglobin structure that produce a characteristic sickle shape or is attributed to inheriting an autosomal recessive gene, possessing two sickling genes as opposed to having the sickle cell trait in which only one sickle gene is inherited. Because of the rigidity of the blood cell and the irregular shape, the sickle cells clump together and block small blood vessels, leading to vascular occlusion or infarcts in organs such as the heart, lungs, kidney, spleen, and central nervous system. Individuals with sickle cell trait may be asymptomatic for their entire life. Exercising excessively in high heat, humidity, or altitude may lead to dehydration, increased body temperature, hypoxia, and even acidosis. Sickle cell anemia predisposes an individual to increased protein concentration in the circulating blood cells. It also causes a high concentration of protein, which increases blood viscosity and impairs blood flow, which can lead to stroke, congestive heart failure, acute renal failure, pulmonary embolism, or even sudden death. The signs and symptoms of sickle cell anemia are recurrent bouts of swollen, painful, and inflamed hands and feet, tachycardia, severe fatigue, headache, pallor, and muscle weakness. There is no known treatment to reverse the condition. We can encourage the individuals to hydrate and use caution in conducive environments. 
We can also help manage the condition by managing dehydration. Dehydration can complicate this condition, and individuals should maximally hydrate before, during, and after exercise or physical exertion. We should also limit running to no more than one mile without rest, and try to avoid activity in extremely hot, humid weather or at altitudes greater than 2,500 feet. Hemophilia is a bleeding disorder characterized by the deficiency of selected proteins in the blood clotting system. There are categories of blood proteins that play a role in blood clotting. Precoagulant proteins help form clots. Anticoagulant proteins prevent the formation of clots. And fibrolytic proteins help dissolve clots that have formed. Platelets stick to blood vessels at the site of an injury. It causes an intricate cascade of enzyme reactions to occur and produce a web-like protein network that encircles the platelets and hold them in place. This is called the platelet phase to form the clot or coagulation phase. In this cascade, each clotting factor is transformed from an inactive to an active form. Hemophilia is an inherited disease. There are three types depending on the deficiency of the clotting factor. Hemophilia A and B occur almost always in boys. Hemophilia C can occur in both boys and girls. Desmopropressin stimulates a release of the body's natural clotting factors that helps stop the bleeding. The major signs and symptoms of hemophilia are excessive bleeding and easy bruising. The extent of bleeding depends on how severe the hemophilia is. Other signs and symptoms of hemophilia may include many large or deep bruises, joint pain and swelling, intramuscular bleeding, blood in the urine or stool, and prolonged bleeding from cuts or injuries. The treatment for hemophilia depends on the type of hemophilia. Individuals with mild hemophilia A may be prescribed injections of desmopropressin. Individuals with severe hemophilia A or hemophilia B will be prescribed infusions of clotting factors and individuals with hemophilia C will be prescribed plasma infusions. A defect in one of the genes that determines how the body makes the clotting factor causes hemophilia. These genes are located on the X chromosome. Chromosomes come in pairs. Females have two X chromosomes, while males have one X and one Y chromosome. The only X chromosome carries the genes relating to clotting factors. A male who has a hemophilia gene on his X chromosome will have hemophilia. When a female has a hemophilia gene on only one of her X chromosomes, she is a hemophilia carrier and can pass the gene on to her children. Sometimes carriers have low levels of clotting factor and have symptoms of hemophilia, including bleeding. Clotting factors are proteins in the body that work together with platelets to stop or control bleeding. Very rarely, a girl may be born with very low clotting factor levels and have a greater risk for bleeding, similar to boys who have hemophilia and very low levels of clotting factor. There are several hereditary and genetic causes of this much rarer form of hemophilia in females. Some males who have the disorder are born to mothers who are not carriers. In these cases, a mutation or a random change occurs in the gene as it passes to the child. Ray's syndrome is a rare but serious acute illness. It almost exclusively affects individuals between the ages of 2 and 16. It tends to occur in previously healthy children and almost always follows an upper respiratory viral infection. It may also develop after a common cold. The precise reason that Ray's syndrome occurs is relatively unknown, but using aspirin to treat the viral illness and infection may trigger the condition in children. The level of ammonia and acidity in the blood typically rises while the level of sugar drops at the same time. The liver may swell and develop fat deposits. Swelling may also occur in the brain and cause seizures or convulsions and eventually lead to a coma and brain death. It progresses quickly and can result in permanent liver damage, irreversible neurological damage, coma, and even death. Conditions typically progress through five stages. Stage one includes lethargy, vomiting, and hepatic dysfunction, followed by a few days of recovery. Stage two includes hyperventilation, delirium, and hyperactive reflexes. 
Stage 3 includes coma and rigidity of the organ cortices. Stage 4 includes a deepening coma, large and fixed pupils, and the loss of cerebral functions. And finally, stage 5 includes seizures, loss of deep tendon reflexes, flaccidity, and respiratory arrest. Ray's syndrome requires hospitalization and intensive treatment. Aspirin may trigger this condition. Aspirin has been linked with Ray's syndrome, so please use caution when giving aspirin to children or teenagers for fever or pain. Although aspirin is approved for use in children older than age 3, children and teenagers recovering from chickenpox or flu-like symptoms should never take aspirin. For the treatment of fever or pain, consider giving your child children's over-the-counter fever and pain medications such as acetaminophen, such as Tylenol or ibuprofen, Advil, Motrin, or others, as a safer alternative to aspirin. Talk to your doctor if you have concerns. Ray's syndrome is characterized by recurrent vomiting beginning within a week after the onset of the condition. The child either recovers rapidly or lapses into a coma with intracranial hypertension. Death may result from a brain edema and cerebral herniation. Early diagnosis and treatment of Ray's syndrome can save a child's life. If you suspect that a young child has Ray's syndrome, it is important to act quickly. Management by hospitalization can help care for an ill child. Syncope often occurs in healthy individuals and is not associated with seizures, coma, shock, or other states of altered consciousness. Syncope is a sudden transient loss of consciousness, also termed fainting. Presyncope is the sense of impending loss of consciousness or weakness. Sometimes we know that we're going to pass out before it actually happens. Presyncope appears more frequently than syncope. Presyncope provides a better source of information to a physician because the patient usually has a better recollection of the event prior to the actual fainting event. Finding out that a patient has a history of syncope during a pre-participation physical examination should warrant a referral to a physician for further evaluation. There are five primary causes of syncope and near syncope related to cardiac and circulatory causes. Cardioinhibitory, bradycardia enhances parasympathetics, neurocardiogenics, vasodiopressor, and occurs when a susceptible person is confronted with a stressful situation. Orthostatic hypertension is a decrease in blood pressure, which occurs when one is assuming an upright position. Outflow obstruction may be caused by aortic stenosis, pulmonic stenosis, subclavian steel syndrome, or mechanical valve function. These individuals may present with exertional syncope, myocardial ischemia or infarction, arrhythmias, and carotid sinus hypersensitivity where syncope might occur with shaving or wearing a tight collar. There are several metabolic causes, such as hypoxia, as with shunting and congenital heart disease. Hyperventilation results in cerebral vasoconstriction, hyperglycemia, and alcohol intoxication or, or other drugs. There are several neurological causes. There's a migraine headache, which is the second most common cause in children. Loss of consciousness is followed by a headache. Also seizures, an abrupt rise in intracranial pressure as seen with subarachnoid hemorrhage. There is a reflex syncope resulting from impaired right side ear filling and global cerebral hypoperfusion. Then there are miscellaneous cough syncopes, psychogenic syncope, severe visceral or ligamentous pain and vertigo. Other causes may be related to heat illness such as heat syncope dehydration, emotional stress, irregular cardiac rhythm, changes in blood volume, or blood distribution. Other signs and symptoms may include dizziness, profuse sweating, paresthesia of the hands and feet, and unilateral or bilateral chest pain. If syncope reoccurs or occurs with exercise, if syncope reoccurs, occurs with exercise, is associated with palpitations or irregularities of the heart, or there is a family history of syncope, a medical evaluation should be conducted. The good news is we can relatively well manage the syncope events. They respond well to avoiding stimuli that trigger the event. 
If syncope does occur, assess and monitor vital signs. Place the individual in a safe lying down position. If there is a loss of consciousness for greater than a few minutes, check for breathing or cardiac impairment and activate EMS. Severity of shock depends on the age, physical condition, pain tolerance, fatigue, dehydration, presence of any disease, extreme cold or heat exposure, or improper handling or movement of an injured area. The types of shock include anaphylactic, cardiogenic, hypovolemic, metabolic, neurogenic, respiratory, psychogenic, and septic shock. The diameter of the arterial blood vessel is controlled by circular layers of smooth muscle that either constrict or relax to regulate peripheral blood flow. Blood vessels dilate during shock. This action increases the size of the vascular bed and decreases the resistance of blood flow, resulting in blood pooling in larger vessels, depriving the brain and vital organs of needed oxygen. As a result, heart rate increases, giving the characteristic rapid, weak pulse that is often the first sign of shock. Shock is a life-threatening condition that occurs when the body is not getting enough blood flow. Lack of blood flow means that the cells and the organs do not get enough oxygen and nutrients to function properly. Many organs can be damaged as a result. Shock requires immediate treatment and can get worse very rapidly. As many as one in five people who suffer shock will die from it. During shock, the heart pumps faster because of decreased blood volume. The pulse is therefore weak and blood pressure drops. We end up in a circulatory distress and if not corrected can lead to unconsciousness and death. Shock can occur in injuries involving severe pain, bleeding, fracture, or intra-abdominal or interthoracic injuries. The severity of shock varies with a variety of factors. The main types of shock include cardiogenic shock, which is due to heart problems, hypovolemic shock, which is caused by too little blood volume, anaphylactic shock, which is caused by an allergic reaction, septic shock, which is due to infections, and neurogenic shock, which is caused by damage to the nervous system. The signs and symptoms of shock develop over time. Signs and symptoms include restlessness, anxiety, disorientation or dizziness, cold, clammy, moist skin, they may initially be pale but later appear cyanotic or bluish, profuse sweating and extreme thirst, the eyes are dull, sunken and the pupils may be dilated, there may be nausea and or vomiting, they have shallow, irregular breathing but may also have labored, rapid or gasping breaths, the pulse is typically rapid and weak. If you suspect a person is in shock, call 911 or the local emergency number. Then immediately take the following steps. Lay the person down and elevate the legs and feet slightly unless you think this may cause pain or further injury. Keep the person still and do not move them unless it is absolutely necessary. Begin CPR if the person shows no signs of life, such as breathing, coughing, or movement. Loosen tight clothing and if needed, cover the person with a blanket to prevent chilling. Do not let the person eat or drink anything. If you suspect that the person is having an allergic reaction and you have access to an epinephrine auto injector, use it according to its instructions. If the person is bleeding, hold pressure over the bleeding area using a towel or a sheet. If the person vomits or begins bleeding from the mouth, Turn him or her onto the side to prevent choking unless you suspect a spinal injury. We can also suffer from blood pressure disorders. Blood pressure is the force per unit area exerted on the walls of an artery. It's a result of cardiac output, which is determined by heart rate, myocardial contraction or the force of contraction, blood volume and venous return, and also by peripheral resistance which is determined by arterial constriction. Any change in either cardiac output or peripheral resistance will result in an increase or decrease in blood pressure, which is our total peripheral resistance. 
Blood pressure reflects the effectiveness of the circulatory system. Blood pressure may be affected by gender, weight, race, lifestyle, and even diet. Blood pressure can vary throughout the day depending on the time of day and the individual's fitness level. It is not unusual for a relatively physically fit person to have a blood pressure of 90 over 70 millimeters per mercury. This is measured in the brachial artery with a sphygmomanometer and a stethoscope. Hypertension affects approximately 50 million individuals in the United States and approximately 1 billion individuals worldwide. The higher the blood pressure, the greater the chance of a myocardial infarction, heart failure, stroke, and kidney disease. In individuals aged 40 to 70 years of age, each increment of 20 millimeters per mercury in systolic blood pressure or 10 millimeters of mercury in diastolic blood pressure doubles the risk of cardiovascular disease across an entire blood pressure range of 115 over 75 to 185 over 115 millimeters of mercury. The onset of hypertension is generally between the ages of 20 and 50 years, with the frequency greatest in African Americans. Hypertension can also be caused by a variety of substances. Hypertension classifications are based on the mean of two or more properly measured seated blood pressure readings that have been taken on more than one occasion. The prehypertension category, patients are at an increased risk for progression to primary or essential hypertension. This is a chronic progressive disorder with no identifiable causes that often attacks the heart, brain, kidneys, and eyes and is associated with increased morbidity and mortality. It can be successfully treated with medication, diet modification, and exercise. Secondary hypertension has an identified cause which often is associated with chronic renal disease, renovascular disease, coartation or constriction or stenosis of an artery or other conditions. This can be controlled once the cause is identified. Cardiac evaluations have become an important aspect among medical evaluations. Some states are even considering or are even mandating a cardiac evaluation be performed during a pre-participation physical examination. This is a letter on May 29, 2019 from an advisory board for the Texas chapter of the American College of Cardiology. This legislative session, the Texas legislator passed a bill which encourages all schools within the UIL to make parents and students aware of the option to obtain an electrocardiogram or ECG as a part of their pre-participation evaluation prior to involvement in high school sports. As the organization responsible for ensuring the cardiovascular health of all people in Texas, the Texas chapter of the American College of Cardiology would like to clarify a few key points of this bill. This bill does not mandate ECG screenings. This bill does not change the current UIL practice of making all parents very aware of the rare but life-threatening problem called sudden cardiac arrest, or SCA. This form educates parents and informs them of the current medical thinking and instructs especially concerned parents to discuss obtaining an ECG on their children thoroughly with a personal physician. This new bill encourages schools to direct parents to their medical homes, where such personalized decisions can be made on an individual basis. The single most important strategy that could save the lives of all young people who suffer from sudden cardiac arrest, not just athletes, is to ensure that the automatic external defibrillator or AED is available in every school, along with clear emergency action plans. Equally as important is the need for every student, athlete, teacher, coach, an athletic trainer and medical physician to be certified in CPR and for there to be regular practice of this plan so that everyone knows where the AED is and how to use it. The prevalence of SCD or sudden cardiac death during physical activity is rare, yet is the leading cause of death in young athletes. It is estimated that sudden death in athletes occurs approximately once every three days in the United States. Males have an estimated death rate five-fold that of females, with the highest rates being seen in basketball and football players. 
explanation for the low occurrence in female athletes is inconclusive. However, some researchers postulate that the decreased incidence can be attributed to the following. Fewer females participate in sports, although that's rapidly changing. Fewer females participate in highly intense sports that require full body protective equipment such as football or ice hockey, although again, that is changing too. And gender differences exist regarding cardiac adaptations to training demands. Females additionally have smaller hearts. Anatomically, females also have smaller hearts. Sudden cardiac death often is precipitated by physical activity and may be caused by an array of cardiovascular conditions. The age of the individual appears to dictate the underlying physiological pathology for the occurrence of sudden cardiac death. The most common cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes under the age of 35 in the United States is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at 26% commotio cordis at 20%, and anomalous coronary arteries 14%. Non-cardiac causes representing only 5% of sudden death in athletes may be caused by death from heat stroke, asthma, cerebral artery rupture, and exertional rhabdomyolysis secondary to sickle cell trait. Arteriosclerotic coronary artery disease such as myocardial ischemia and myocardial infarction is the leading cause for individuals older than 35 years of age, accounting for up to 80% of such events. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or HCM, develops before age 20. It is the leading cause of sudden death in young, physically active individuals. By definition, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a hypertrophied, non-dilated left ventricle in the absence of other cardiac and systemic diseases capable of producing the degree of hypertrophy present. A normal left ventricle is about one centimeter thick. In HCM, the ventricular wall typically ranges from two to four centimeters thick and can be greater than 15 centimeters thick. HCM is usually genetically transmitted and appears in childhood and adolescence reaching full development by the time of physical maturity. HCM should be suspected in young athletes who present with exertional dyspnea, chest pain, unexplained syncope, or prior recognition of a heart murmur. A family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, sudden cardiac death, heart disease in a close relative under the age of 50, or unexplained syncope should also raise red flags during the assessment of the patient. During the physical examination, the most important finding is a systolic murmur, increased or elicited by a provocative maneuver such as the valsalva, standing, or exertion. As a result, period of arrhythmias or blood flow obstruction may produce syncope during physical exertion. Any individual exhibiting these signs or symptoms should be seen immediately by a physician or by a cardiologist. Mitral valve prolapse is a redundant tissue that's found on one or both leaflets of the mitral valve. During a ventricular contraction, part of the redundant tissue pushes back beyond the normal limit. This produces an abnormal sound followed by a systolic murmur as blood is regurgitated back through the mitral valve and into the left atrium. Mitral valve prolapse is not a frequent cause of sudden death, but can affect 2 to 5% of the population spanning all ages. This is also known as click murmur syndrome. Individuals with mitral valve prolapse usually experience some degree of chest pain, dyspnea, palpitations, and fatigue with exertion. Myocarditis is characterized by the infiltration of inflammatory cells into the myocardium, leading to an abnormally enlarged left ventricle. This can result in electrical instability and life-threatening arrhythmias. This may be asymptomatic or symptoms in common with a viral infection. Symptoms commonly associated with viral infections include fever, body aches, fatigue, cough or vomiting, which often impedes the diagnosis. The cardiac symptoms associated with myocarditis include exercise intolerance, shortness of breath, palpitations, and syncope may occur without warning. Coronary artery disease is the most common sudden cause of death in individuals older than age 35 years. 
This is also known as arteriosclerosis. If excessive cholesterol buildup blocks a coronary artery, the person is at risk for a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. If the blockage is in a major coronary artery, death often occurs. Physical activity in individuals older than age 35 have usually experienced prodromal cardiovascular symptoms or have a known medical history of coronary artery disease. Individuals older than age 30 years have three options. They can ignore the symptoms and continue participating at the same level, placing themselves at risk for sudden death. They can change their lifestyle according to coronary artery disease recommendations and continue to participate in limited activity or they can no longer participate in physical activity. The American College of Sports Medicine, or ACSM, has a list of risk factors for coronary artery disease. Individuals who are at risk may be subjected to exercise electrocardiogram or a treadmill stress test before beginning an exercise program. Anyone with a history of angina, palpitations, syncope, or dyspnea during exercise should have an exercise ECG or electrocardiogram before beginning a moderate or vigorous exercise program. Marfan syndrome, it does not necessarily lead to sudden cardiac death. When sudden cardiac death does occur, it is usually caused by the condition's hallmark characteristic, a weakened aorta. A single mutant gene is linked to the condition there is no family history in one third of all cases. Marfan syndrome has some distinct physical features. Individuals are typically tall with overly long extremities. Their arm span exceeds the person's height. They also have hypermobile joints, a pigeon or sunken chest, stretch marks, scoliosis, which is a curvature of the spine, and increased incident of hernias. Among the many tests to determine Marfan syndrome, two are the thumb test and the wrist test. The thumb test involves a deduction of the thumb across the palm of the hand and flexion of the fingers around the thumb. This test is positive if the thumb extends past the fifth finger, such as the picture on the upper right. The wrist test involves the person encircling a wrist with the thumb and fifth finger of the opposite hand. This is a positive test if the thumb and the fifth finger or pinky finger overlap. It is not unusual to find an excessively high palate, eye defects, particularly myopia or nearsightedness, mitral valve prolapse, and defects in the connective tissue layers of the aorta. These individuals should be advised to avoid contact sports because of the risk of eye injury and injury to the aorta. Individuals with Marfan syndrome can still participate in activity, although it depends on what is going on. If the individual does not have evidence of aortic root dilation, participation in moderate low static and low dynamic competitive activities is okay. In an individual with aortic root dilation, only participate in low intensity physical activities. Both long QT syndrome and right ventricular dysplasia may contribute to sudden cardiac death as both conditions produce serious arrhythmias. Long QT syndrome usually affects children and young adults. It is a hereditary disorder of the heart's electrical system. The heart is inefficient in its contractions, reducing the normal blood volume in the body and in the brain. Right ventricular dysplasia is a disorder of the right ventricle causing the formation of adipose or, or fibrous tissue extending from the epicardium to the endocardium. The abnormal growth of tissue increases the risk of ventral fibrillation. Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is an abnormality of the cardiac rhythm that manifests as supraventricular tachycardia. It is associated with an accessory electrical pathway in the heart proximal to the ventricles that can spontaneously produce episodes of rapid twitching of the atrium muscle fibers within a range of 200 to 300 beats per minute. Often individuals with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome are asymptomatic during electrocardiogram examination. This is rarely associated with sudden death but may complicate other heart conditions such as myocarditis or ischemic heart disease. 
congenital coronary artery abnormalities. The most common anomaly is an abnormal origin of the left coronary artery. Other anomalies may involve an abnormal origin of the right coronary artery, presence of a right coronary artery without a left coronary artery, and abnormal coronary artery spasm. This may not be detected during exercise because symptoms such as syncope, near syncope, and chest pain are intermittent and unpredictable. Commotio cordis is an often lethal disruption of the heart rhythm that occurs as a result of a blow to the area directly over the heart at a critical time during the cycle of a heartbeat causing cardiac arrest. Commotio cordis is rare in sports. The mechanism of injury is typically a projectile striking the chest, including baseballs, softballs, hockey pucks, and lacrosse balls. In post-mortem analysis, Structural damage to the heart or overlying protective structures such as the sternum and the ribs as well as soft tissue contusions of the left chest wall are commonly visualized, suggesting that sudden death in these cases resulted from blunt force induced conduction abnormalities. Prevention strategies include the use of protective padding equipment that covers the area of the chest over the heart and switching to balls or pucks that are made of softer material, especially for younger individuals. Amphetamines are central nervous system stimulants. They increase heart rate, respiration rate, and blood pressure. The use of cocaine can result in myocarditis. Myocarditis has been found in autopsy reports of cocaine-related sudden cardiac death cases. A massive dose of cocaine is not required to produce cardiac or respiratory consequences. There have been several reported cases of sudden cardiac death in anabolic steroid users. Although a direct relationship between steroid use and sudden death has not yet been established. Erythropoietin is a hormone produced by the kidneys that stimulates bone marrow to increase the production of red blood cells. This became synthetically available in the late 1980s when used as an ergogenic aid for endurance athletes. Erythropoietin is equal to blood doping and like blood doping can increase the blood volume and viscosity of the blood, leading to decreased circulation, thrombosis, and myocardial infarction. This may be one of the most deadly ergogenic aids available. A two-tiered approach to screening must be implemented. First, identification of possible cardiovascular abnormalities during a cardiac history or standard physical examination is the first tier to recognition. The second tier involves referral to a cardiologist for a more extensive screening, including an echocardiogram. These guidelines present a somewhat standard approach for reducing the incidence of sudden cardiac death although no universal standard for screening in high school athletes exists. Most pre-participation standards are set by state legislation, state athletic associations, or individual school districts, and most often consist of a medical history review and basic physical examination. A standard screening examination occurs six to eight weeks before the start of the sports season and at least every two years thereafter. The cardiac history should include extensive questions on previous symptomatic episodes and a family history. Physical examination should include, but not be limited to, a precordial auscultation to identify heart murmurs, assessment of the femoral artery pulses, checking for signs of Marfan syndrome, and measuring brachial blood pressure. We have evidence that somebody could be at risk for sudden cardiac death we should refer them to a specialist, such as a cardiologist, for a more extensive screening, including an echocardiogram, particularly when seeking detection of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The decision regarding whether to permit an individual to participate after identifying a cardiovascular abnormality must be resolved on an individual basis under the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and similar state statutes prohibiting unjust discrimination against the physically impaired. 
These laws permit an individual with the physical capabilities and skills to participate in a sport despite the fact that a cardiovascular abnormality may be present. Exclusion from participation must be based on reasonable medical judgment given the state of scientific research on the specific condition. We are required to carefully balance the individual's right to participate, the physician's evaluation of the medical risk of participation, and an organization's interest in conducting a safe athletic program. Many healthcare professionals believe emergency preparedness and management of sudden cardiac arrest is a priority for every sports venue, including high school and collegiate athletic programs. As part of a well-defined emergency action plan, every facility should establish catastrophic incident guidelines that address the immediate action plan, chain of command responsibilities, standards for documentation of the event, and long-term support for individuals who may be affected by sudden cardiac death. Emergency action plans should include CPR and AED training for all targeted first responders, and recommends that access to early defibrillation is essential within less than three to five minutes from the time of collapse to the first shock. The review of equipment readiness and the emergency action plan by on-site personnel for each athletic event is desirable, as is the annual review of the emergency action plan. Sudden death in sports is a rare event. The medical workup should depend on a patient's family and personal medical history. We should also know that the first presentation of a cardiac issue may be the event of sudden death itself. So we need to be prepared. I would encourage all individuals who work around sports to get and maintain their CPR and first aid certification. You never know when you might have to step in and be an important part of saving someone's life.